Worldlink TV presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Welcome to the News in Brief. The World Economic Forum ends its work at the Dead Sea Resort. Anand calls on the international community to work on ending the suffering of Palestinians and Iraqis. Condoleezza Rice will visit the Middle East at the end of the week. The Palestinian president holds Israel responsible for delaying the implementation of the roadmap. The Israeli leadership continues to escalate the situation more and more, thus delaying the implementation of the roadmap especially since crimes are committed while the Quartet meets in the World Economic Forum at the Dead Sea. An announcement is made about the creation of a new Iraqi army. Meanwhile, soldiers from the former Ministry of Defense will be paid their salaries. Iran rejects signing on to an additional and more rigorous protocol to allow international monitors to carry out inspections in Iran. Tehran accuses Washington of lying about Iran's nuclear program. From Tehran, our correspondent, Najah Muhammad Ali. Iran said that they will defend themselves against any U.S. aggression under the pretext of Iran's nuclear reactor, which Iran clarified is for peaceful purposes. Iran says that they will conduct positive negotiations with the International Atomic Energy Agency regarding initiating more rigorous inspections of its nuclear facilities. Iran also stated that they will defend all of their programs and nuclear plans and that they will take all measures to prove to the world that they do not have a military nuclear program. This is the end of the News in Brief. Welcome. The Palestinian and Israeli security meeting has ended. They discussed the security measures in preparation for the Israeli withdrawal from the Gaza Strip and Bethlehem. During the meeting, Palestinian Minister of Security Affairs, Mohammed Dahlan, presented the Palestinians' demands, focusing on the freedom of movement for the Palestinians and stopping the demolition and assassination operations. The Israeli delegation promised to review these demands and respond to them within 24 hours. Meanwhile, in the Gaza Strip today, a funeral procession was held for four Palestinian activists. However, there are conflicting reports as to how the four activists were killed. Whenever there is a chance for things to calm down for the Palestinians and move forward with the peace process, Sharon's government begins another military attack. Four Palestinians were killed in Beit Hanun, north of the Gaza Strip. They were fired at by Israeli tanks while fulfilling their national duties. All our organizations are announcing that the response to this horrible crime committed by the Zionist enemy will be harsh. We are announcing that soon you will hear of the exceptional martyrdom attacks. Three of the martyrs were members of Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade's Fatah's military wing. The fourth was a member of the martyr Abu Ali Mustafa Brigades, the popular front's military wing. Their bodies were carried in a funeral procession from Gaza to the occupied Beit Hanun, where the Palestinian Authority is expected to take over the security responsibilities. The Palestinian factions must unite on a national position. We should always be asking ourselves, what do the Palestinians want? and what serves the Palestinian interests. I believe that the truce will benefit the Palestinian interests at this stage, and an honorable Palestinian ceasefire in accordance with the Palestinian conditions that were presented, such as stopping the assassinations, releasing the detainees, and ending the incursions. At this stage, a ceasefire is vital and necessary. However, Israel doesn't seem to be concerned with the truce. The occupation forces demolished two homes and damaged others in the western refugee camp in Khan Yunus. During this incursion, an Israeli soldier was lightly wounded in a gunfire exchange. The Palestinian factions are expected to respond to the truce and ceasefire issues. Meanwhile, Israel is escalating its operations. 
thus hindering efforts to reach a truce which has already been rejected by Israel. With us today is Dr. Sa'ib Araikat, who became very familiar to us during the last 11 years. We want to talk about the roadmap as of today. Do you think that it survived the huge setbacks during the last week? Or do you think that the setbacks will continue, as has been the typical pattern in dealing with the Israelis during the last 50 years? In reality, the roadmap is not a new invention. It is a way of putting together all the commitments that were agreed upon previously by both the Israelis and the Palestinians, adding three new points. I'm one of those who negotiated that roadmap for many long months. The first point on the roadmap is identifying a goal. And for the first time, the phrase ending the occupation that started in 1967 and establishing an independent and sovereign Palestinian state was introduced. Second, there are three phases with a deadline to end the occupation and establish a state by 2005. Third, international observers who represent the Quartet Committee will be placed in the area. The question is, does Israel accept the roadmap? I think when the Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon says that he accepts the roadmap with 14 conditions, which they have introduced to the American administration, each one of these conditions, which I have seen, totally cancels the roadmap. Thus, it is important for us to say no to the Israeli trickery in playing with words. I think that the roadmap should not be a repetition of what we have always been doing, because that would not lead to new results. That must be changed. The only way for us, the Palestinians, to ensure the fulfillment of the roadmap is to have Israel fulfill the commitments of the first stage. The Palestinians have to fulfill 15 requirements, and the Israelis have to fulfill 12 requirements, all of which are non-negotiable. The Israelis are required to dismantle all settlement posts that were built after March 2001. Sharon has to fulfill this clause. To stop all Israeli settlement activities, including the expansion of settlement for natural growth, to withdraw from the Palestinian areas that were occupied after September 28, 2000, ending the curfews and closures, transferring the withheld taxes to the Palestinian Authority, and to release Palestinian detainees. All of these are binding articles in the roadmap. In order for these articles to be achieved, the American administration and President Bush must intervene. But since February, we do not know how to deal with President Bush, should we deal with him as the president of the U.S. or as the president of Iraq? There is a new reality in the region, and we must take that into consideration. Now we live in a region whose people and borders can be changed. Thus, President Bush is now acting as the president of Iraq after this new occupation. Why have the American administration and the European Union not yet proposed ways in which the roadmap can be fulfilled, timetables, and the international observers? What prevents the American administration from achieving three points? The problem is not in the text of the peace agreements or the documents that have been signed. The problem is the consecutive Israeli governments who want to take shortcuts. They refuse to accept commitments and timetables. It is important to have fulfillment mechanisms, timetables, and international observers. I'm not asking the U.S. to provide negotiators to represent the Israelis and the Palestinians. No. Bush, who sent 350,000 soldiers with all their military equipment to declare war on Iraq, can send 350 unarmed observers so that they can tell the media, like ANN and CNN, about which side is fulfilling its commitments. At this point, it is hard for ordinary Israeli and Palestinian citizens to believe anything. They need to see tangible fulfillments. We can no longer afford using trickery language, manipulating facts, or exchanging accusations. Truly, the situation is very very dangerous.
Lebanon assailants have attacked a fuel pipeline in western Iraq near the border with Syria. An oil official told AFP Monday asking not to be named. The official said the Iraqi ministry is aware of the attack near Al Abadi Al Garbiya, not far from the Syrian border, adding it seems there are people prepared to mount such attacks every day on Iraq's pipelines. A gas duct exploded west of Baghdad late Saturday in a blast described by residents as sabotage. Earlier, 2,000 Iraqis have taken to the streets of Basra to demand the departure of U.S. and British occupation troops from Iraq. Shouting down, down USA, down, down Britain, some 2,000 Iraqi protesters took to the streets of southern Iraqi city of Basra on Sunday to demand the withdrawal of American and British occupation forces, the election of a new town council, and the appointment of an Iraqi governor to rule Basra. The demonstrators handed British occupation officers a petition listing a wide range of demands, ranging from religious to political issues. So we ask them to respect the Iraqi people, to, uh, to respect the Iraqi people and to respect the sacred places, especially mosques, temples, and worshipping places. So they agreed to do so and they promised to make a town council. Uh, elected town council, which were elected by the people here in the world, to work together with the town council, which was appointed by the uh, British authorities. In the meantime, and in an apparent sign of the tension that the Iraqi capital is facing, Iraqi police opened fire Sunday on a civilian vehicle that jumped a police roadblock, seriously injuring the driver. The shooting came after one U.S. soldier was killed in a grenade attack and another was wounded in an attack on a military convoy at Khan Azad, some 20 kilometers south of Baghdad. The latest death brings to 53 the number of U.S. troops killed since war against Iraq was declared over on May 1st. In another development, U.S. troops calmed the area of Madmil, a southern suburb of Baghdad, late on Sunday, searching for Iraqi resistance fighters. Troops entered houses and checked vehicles on the streets and made several arrests. Meanwhile, in the town of Hid, some 140 kilometers northwest of Baghdad, a blast ripped through a gas pipeline belonging to the Basra Gas Company. It continued to rage in fire after what residents said was a deliberate attack. The U.S. military confirmed the explosion without confirming its cause. If the United States wanted to take advantage of this, they would have controlled the fire by now. The fire has been burning since 11 o'clock last night until this minute. Outgoing U.S. Commander General Tommy Franks said he believes the U.S. occupation of Iraq could require more than 200,000 troops, depending on how ongoing events unfold. According to the New Yorker magazine issued on Sunday, Franks also said that after the war ended, he thought Iraq's ousted President Saddam Hussein could have been killed in the first strike against him, adding that there is nothing that convinces him that Saddam is still alive. San Salvador's Roman Catholic Archbishop Fernando Sanz said Sunday President Francisco Flores' decision to send soldiers to Iraq was due to U.S. pressure on his administration. Flores announced Saturday that he wants to send some 300 Salvadoran soldiers to the region to help in landmine removal and health-related areas. U.S. pressure also pushed Belgium to radically change a Belgian law, which gives Belgian courts the right to judge anyone accused of war crimes, crimes against humanity or genocide. Human Rights Watch said it is regrettable that under irrational pressure from the United States, the Belgian government is renouncing fundamental principles, adding that to exclude a complaint that questions the actions of a democratic country is going too far. Belgium announced Sunday it was drastically reducing the scope of a Belgian law that caused a rift with Washington after it was used in attempts to indict U.S. leaders for crimes against humanity. The 1993 law, as it stands, gives Belgian courts the right to judge anyone accused of war crimes, crimes against humanity or genocide, regardless of the suspect's country of origin or where the crime took place. Under the law, cases were brought against U.S. President George W. Bush and British Prime Minister Tony Blair accusing them of war crimes over the war in Iraq. Suits against U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell, U.S. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld and U.S. General Tommy Franks prompted Rumsfeld to call the law absurd, warning America would suspend its funding for new NATO headquarters in Brussels. 
Belgian Prime Minister Guy Verhofstadt told journalists that the legislation known as the Universal Competence Law will not be scrapped but modified so that it does not apply to democratic countries. But Belgium has refused to bow to US pressure simply to repeal it. Verhofstadt also denied Sunday his government acted under American pressure in bringing in the new revised version. He said the law would now only affect Belgian nationals or persons resident in Belgium or victims who are Belgian or have had their permanent residence in Belgium for at least three years. The revised law would thus apply only to undemocratic countries. The bill governing the new legislation also ensures that there will be no government interference in proceedings arising from the law. Under a recent revised version, the Belgian government was able to decide whether to refer complaints to their countries of origin. Belgian Foreign Minister Louis Michel said the revised law will meet the concern of countries rightly worried about the possible deviations and abuses that the law could cause. Michel himself on Friday had a case lodged against him for alleged crimes against humanity following a contentious arms sale to Nepal. Only this month the law was invoked to press an indictment against Israeli General Amos Yaron for his role in the 1982 massacres of Palestinian refugees at Sabra and Shatila in Lebanon. However, Belgian court proceedings against Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon on similar grounds were put on ice by by Belgium's appeals court for the period of his term of office. The extraordinary meeting of the World Economic Forum concluded on the shores of the Dead Sea with a common call for joint efforts by all nations to enhance peace and spur world economies. Some 1,200 delegates from about 65 nations took part in the three-day gathering held under the banner Visions for a Shared Future. In a speech at the closing session, His Majesty King Abdullah hailed the meeting as marking a new beginning for the Palestinians, the Iraqis and the Israelis. Our meeting has succeeded in bringing Palestinians and Israelis together to talk. They spoke about peace and reconciliation. But they also discussed the environment and water. The dialogue affirmed their shared humanity and shared destiny. These and other discussions helped spur renewed faith among the friends of peace. Faith that is needed to usher a new day in this holy land, a day when trust and forgiveness replace discord and animosity. Our meeting witnessed the global support for the road to peace in the Middle East. It reiterated the milestones agreed at Aqaba to end the conflict, to renew hope, assure security, and fulfill Palestinian nationhood. By seizing this historic moment, this forum has helped to seize the international conscience, reminding the world of the need to serve justice and meet the expectations of the young. Our meetings also discuss human development in the Arab world. It is an issue that you, Mr. Secretary General, have championed during the last two years. And it's an issue at the forefront of regional concern. The pillars of all Arab civil society actively participated in our gatherings. They deliberated here on reform and progress, on ways of fulfilling young people's expectations for knowledge and freedom, protect the human rights of men and women, and respect the sanctity of free expression to all those whose opinions will undoubtedly contribute to strengthening our political and social structure. The King said the gathering provided an opportunity to demonstrate the Jordanian civil and dynamic society. For Jordan and Jordanians, the last three days have been filled with pride and gratitude. We hope we succeeded in demonstrating our emerging civil society. We hope that you had a chance to meet some of the people 
from every sphere of life who are building our dynamic country. We strove to provide an opportunity for the women of Jordan to fully participate in setting the global agenda. And we hoped to give the young Jordanians a chance to express their dreams and aspirations for peace in the region, open to the world where their skills and talents can flourish. So I thank you for giving my country the opportunity to host this meeting. And I think I want to thank each one of you for contributing to its success. Your efforts are far more important than you know. Participants in the WEF meeting hailed the deliberations over the past three days, but said that peace and stability are prerequisites for human and economic development. Arab businessmen said it was premature to promote business dealings with Israel until a lasting Israeli-Palestinian peace accord was in place. The delegates expressed various views on how to face the challenges ahead. Nidair Ramahe from the venue of the meeting tells us more. A statement made by UN Secretary General Kofi Annan at the conclusion of the three-day World Economic Forum that brought together more than 1,300 dignitaries, officials and businessmen to the Dead Sea shores of Jordan. Uh, we've had a chance to discuss a number of economic and political opportunities. The meeting that took place also uh, by the Quartet to discuss uh, future steps uh, on the peace process was a very important one and it allowed also for the presence of a large number of political dignitaries able to meet and uh, uh, to discuss ways of moving forward. Uh, we're very, very satisfied uh, with this conference. I um, must add also that the presence of the private sector in Jordan was very impressive. Uh, over 180 personalities participated in this conference. Today's discussions focused on the practical ways of solving some of the economic challenges. And although there was a difference between the European and American outlooks on how to go about it, one agreement concerned the issue of agriculture. We have to be able to tackle the agricultural aspect. I mean, an equitable agricultural policy would definitely allow many, many developing countries to get out of poverty. It would be an alleviation of poverty. And therefore, I think it's a critical aspect. I personally believe we, we have to be careful that we do not substitute multilateral agreements like the WTO agreements through many, many, many individual uh, free trade agreements. Although the conference seemed to cover a massive amount of topics, including Mideast Peace Plan, Iraq's reconstruction, the world's economic development, the one thing that seemed to echo at the conclusion was that these issues needed to be discussed for any development to take place. Before you act, you have to develop a strategy and for doing so, you have to interact, you have to discuss, you have to integrate everybody into the process. Uh, just to do action would be completely nonsense because then you do not have direction. You have to discuss the direction, you have to discuss the strategies before you act. And that's what has been done here. And by doing so, you create also the mutual understanding, you create the trust. There were many theories that were put forth here at the World Economic Forum Conference, the three-day World Economic Forum, and there were also practical steps that were put forth. But in 10 months' time, there will be a review when another forum takes place here in the country to examine just how well the ideas that have been put forth have been implemented and how well the relationships that have been developed here will bloom. Nidara Mahi reporting for the World Economic Forum from the Dead Sea. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes journalism excellence worldwide and invests in the vitality of 26 U.S. communities, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, 